welcome to Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people in the Android community. I'm Finn Dow, and I'm speaking with... I'm Jake Wharton. Hey, Jake. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so, for having me. <laughs> so where are you based? Uh, currently, I'm based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Nice, nice. And uh, how'd you get started in Android? So uh, I got started in Android a long time ago. It was the... Uh, Google released this um, initial SDK, the M3 preview SDK. Uh, but, you know, before there was really anything, there was only the emulator. And alongside with that, there was a contest. And so being in college at the time, this contest had a $100,000 <laughs> reward for various first places in all these categories. And I was determined to win this $100,000 and, you know, I would be set for life. Not Rolling really... in ramen. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it, you know, it was the catalyst that got me into it and I started learning a ton of stuff, never actually submitted an app in the contest, but it was the catalyst for getting me into the platform. And then I just kept coming back to it, uh, over time and eventually moved into the industry working on it full time. Nice. Now, um, of all of our guests, I feel like people will probably know who you are, um, and know a lot about what you've done. You know, um, obviously you've contributed a lot to the Android community and a lot of open source libraries. Um, so we could probably spend a lot of time talking about each one of those. I was kind of curious about kind of something that you could choose really um, for RS Android because RS Java is really hot right now. You know, it's so hot right now. And <laughs> um, I know that you've been working on kind of a big upgrade to RS Android. So could you kind of maybe um, talk about like, what it is to begin with, how it relates to you know the other reactive extensions in RS Java and what you've been doing with it? Lately. Sure. Um, yeah, upgrade is an interesting term uh, because that's <laughs> co not quite exactly what happened. If anything, it was a downgrade, but it was a, a good downgrade. So for those that aren't aware, uh, RxJava and the reactive extension stuff is this kind of fundamental pattern, which is uh, the dual of an iterator where instead of pulling values, you get values pushed uh, into you, into these callbacks in which you can compose. And so it's this very powerful system that you can build large uh, event-based apps or you know, server um, or even web clients, there's JavaScript clients. And so it's this uh, architecture and suite of libraries. And Rx Android is the project that was started, I think about two years ago. Uh, and it, it, its design, its goal was to adapt the concepts in Rx Java to, to work on Android and to make it easier on Android. And so uh, over time, there were a lot of things added to this library and about uh, six months ago or so, it, it kind of realized that we were uh, we were stuck. The library was stagnant. Not a lot was happening. There's lots of different opinions, people wanting to pull it uh, in different ways and contribute new things. And so um, in just talking with a bunch of developers that work with RxJava on Android, we ultimately decided that in order to get this library to a 1.0 to make an actual release and to have it be have its contents be applicable to as many people as possible, we actually ended up tearing uh, almost every class out of the library, except nice. for this really focused core that just does uh, the bare minimum of what you need on Android, which yeah. is uh, like knowing about the main thread. Right, right. And so it went from a lot of these utilities down to about four classes. Uh, and with that, we ended up releasing uh, a 1.0 finally. Nice. Um, but so all these utilities were not useless that were in there. and mm -hmm. they have been finding new homes. So there's libraries popping up that are very, very focused in very specific things. Mm -hmm. It's adapting, uh, you know, the preferences API or right. oh, cool. location services, mm -hmm. you know, getting, uh, requesting location updates and getting those location updates mm -hmm. and uh, all different kinds of these libraries, which now themselves are very focused and can, you know, have their own release schedule and their own versions. And you can kind of pick and choose a la carte, which ones you want to include right. in your app. Right. That's cool. Uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Nice. nice. So I was kind of curious, you know, like, I feel like a lot of times things will pop up and, you know, like new library, new tool or something. And it's like, well, it seems kind of cool, but then it never either takes off either because it doesn't, you know, get maintained or it kind of people just drop off of it or it just doesn't seem to work out. At what point did you feel like ArcsJava was something that was really kind of interesting to you and was like, hey, we should use this. We should, this should like kind of, I guess, supplant what we're doing now. And it, what, what kind of, when did you kind of realize, hey, this is, this is something cool? that's worth work, working on? Um, it was about, it was, it was actually almost two years ago now. Um, Netflix has this policy. So the initial Java 
implementation was by Netflix before they ended up moving it into its own kind of GitHub org and right. um, you know making it more of a community effort rather than a company effort. Mm -hmm. And so at the time they had actually from day one had this library open source. Um, so interest was building around it and the nice thing was that you were able to kind of watch the progress and see where it was heading. And so about two years ago we, uh, we uh, I mean uh, a few of us at Square started just experimenting with it to see what it would look like inside of an app. And we had known that other people uh, were also seeing this and, and experimenting with it as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of the problems we were having at the time were dealing with composing these asynchronous HTTP calls, these yeah, API yeah. calls. Yeah. And uh, you know, in about two hours, I was able to build this example app that was able to uh, compose these various uh, orders and um, parallel API calls together yeah. in a way that was basically completely hid the threading model and the mm -hmm. uh, concurrency model just behind these really clean APIs and yeah. that was the thing that just like made it click yeah and I knew that like this this was something that was going to be big and that we had to start investing in it and it wasn't it certainly wasn't just me at Square there were a lot sure, of us yeah. that were were playing with it at the time and uh, that's what really kicked off our our interest right. and yeah. Uh, we ended up not only incorporating it into all of our apps, but it's in a couple of our open source libraries as well. Nice. So it's like a thousand light bulbs kind of lit up and just like Arc Java. Yeah, That's it's like... uh, it's it's a different way of thinking, but yeah, once you kind of once you get that way of thinking, you start seeing everything as streams yeah. and how how to compose them and uh, break them apart just to to create these different pieces of your app. Yeah, and that does feel, seem to feel like the kind of like the biggest curve to get over with it is just thinking differently and thinking about things like in the kind of reactive sort of way. That seems like that's it, the part that stumps people the most. Like it's very hard to break out of the the so-called imperative way yeah. where you just want to write an if or you just want to you know store something in a in a field or a local variable for for use inside of a callback or another method later and you just have to uh, you have to basically unlearn that way and, and realize that there are there are ways built into this pattern, this reactive pattern that's that accomplish those same goals mm -hmm. just in a completely different way. And once you switch that way of thinking, uh, it hopefully becomes a lot easier. Nice. All right, so I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you for a little advice. So obviously you're pretty experienced with writing libraries. And so what if I have, you know, what if I'm writing like one library and I have another library and what do I do when one library depends on another. Like, how do I manage those dependent, those like codependencies? Uh, yeah, it's it's a hard problem, uh, and so we we see this in about um, we have si these six open source libraries that kind of all have this common dependency, and then of course you have to deal with things like uh, Android, or if you're dealing with kind of Java libraries in general, usually like Guava is a common library that everyone will include. Right. Uh, it, and I don't think there's any real right answer. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I was asked this question at a, a conference a couple of months ago, and I, I really kind of had the same non-answer, and it's just uh, the way that you do it is carefully. <laughs> uh, you, just, you just have to be mindful, and right. really if you're working with people that are uh, both aware of libraries you're depending on and yeah. aware of the libraries which are depending on you, mm -hmm. you can make changes in your library in a way that's that's compatible. Mm -hmm. And so you see this, uh, you see this of course in Android, which has historically done an amazing job of keep you know, amazing if you think of the the breadth of the APIs they offer. Right. An amazing job of keeping compatibility. Mm -hmm. So I have an Android app that I wrote in 2008, I think, mm -hmm. on the Play Store. Uh, nice. It targets API 1, right? and nice. I haven't updated it, but it's I can still install it on my Nexus 6 running the mm -hmm. latest Marshmallow, and it will work fine. Nice. And so right. really that's just the Android engineers being cognizant of the fact and uh, wanting to offer that level of support in APIs they expose. And so it's really just the same thing. When you're, when you're changing something, uh, just be mindful of the fact that someone is relying on the behavior of this method, and mm -hmm. if you're changing it subtly or drastically, that might have a uh, drastic impact on them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all, all the things that you should be doing normally are things that help with this, which is like testing. Mm -hmm. You know, when you write a unit test that uh, tests the behavior of a method, and then that test starts failing, a lot of people, uh, some people's instinct is to go in and fix the test, but maybe that test failing is an indicator that you've actually broken the contract of the library and it's not the test that needs fixed. You know, you kind of have to reconcile the fact that maybe you can't 
uh, change the method or the library in this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's really just, just being careful, being mindful, and um, kind of looking to the Guava and the Android of the world, which do a really amazing job of just keeping that backwards compatibility because mm -hmm. when you break it, uh, it, it not only affects you know you pulling that library in the app, but uh, an unknown amount of people downstream who also will will have to update their library. And that's not to say you shouldn't ever break it because obviously like uh, you know patterns change, you, right, yeah. you change as a developer, you, better ways of implementing things comes out, and mm -hmm. sometimes you make that change, but uh, try to limit that to you know every whatever year, two years, not not happening all the time with every release, but. Uh, if you're gonna break the change, make it. Or if you're gonna break the API, make it a meaningful, right? Meaningful breakage yeah. and uh, like a high value proposition for why the why people should actually upgrade to that new version. Cool. Um, so talking about high value proposition, so something that I've seen you talk about a lot, and it's kind of like something that's dear to my heart, is kind of efficiency and performance and optimization. I know you recently gave a talk at mm -hmm. Square about that. So I, I kind of something that comes up to me a lot is like you know we, there's this whole thing about, oh, you don't want to pre-optimize or, you know, like, don't, you know, don't worry to be like, and I, I've got people telling me, I was like, why do I care about optimization? Like, why do I care about all these things? You know, my app will be running on like a Nexus 6 or whatever, the Nexus 5 that's coming out this year. So I want to ask you, why should we care about optimization as like Android developers? Uh, so I think there's, there's two reasons. And I, when I speak about it, I think I come more from a, a library developer perspective than mm -hmm. an app developer. Because mm -hmm. uh, when you're a library developer, you are not in control of uh, you know where your code is being run. So you want to have as little adverse impact as possible. Mm -hmm. So you're not you know allocating a ton of things. You're not wasting CPU. You're not causing. You're not being the source of a problem in the person's app. And so that's that's like a very uh, specific place to be thinking about performance from, which is completely different than not completely, but is is definitely different when you think of. Uh, performance and optimization as an app developer mm -hmm. because uh, you know I've historically just been on the side of just you know get it working get it done yeah and then yeah. you can optimize later right but um, and, and I still very much subscribe to that like mm -hmm. just just get it out the door even if you have to do ugly things yeah the longer you the longer you wait is gonna be more harmful than the fact that you're using enums right uh, <laughs> right no that makes sense but yeah so uh, the other thing is that even if you're not even if you're not like practicing all these optimizations to the T all the time, yeah, just being aware of them mm -hmm. is going to affect how you how you write the app and how you you know structure your code and the decisions that you make. Mm -hmm. So, going back to enums, which is this topic that will not die, yeah. <laughs> um, just being aware of the fact that you know enums have that overhead, mm -hmm. and sure you can throw in one, you can throw in ten, you can probably throw in a hundred and be totally fine. But uh, if you're targeting, you know, a very specific market like these, you know, underserved countries that are just now getting these Android One devices that, and yeah. mobile for the first time, yeah. they don't have the new Nexus Five. They yeah. don't have these Nexus Sixes. So there is an actual concern there for memory. Mm -hmm. Or if you're, uh, you know, want to have this really dynamic and engaging onboarding experience, but that requires you to embed. 40 megabytes worth of videos for, uh, you know, four screens <laughs> yeah. that the user's just going to flip through as fast as possible to get into your app. Yeah. You know, maybe that's something that uh, you should consider not doing or, or you know, take another approach. So mm -hmm. uh, really just being aware of the fact that these performance optimizations exist. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not, even if you're not following them all, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to affect the decisions that you make. And uh, if anything, it will constantly remind you to to go back and uh, mm -hmm. make sure that you're doing these optimizations eventually. Right. So hopefully. I mean, it's a fair balance, like to like you said, getting stuff out the door, but also being cognizant of like, well, we're on devices, you know, like, and there's a wide range, like you said. So, kind of, so it it depends, and be cognizant. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, like, well, I guess that's all we have time for so far. So thanks so much for joining us, Jake. Where can find people find you on the internet? So you can follow me on Twitter um, at Jake Wharton, usually ranting. Uh, Google Plus, also uh, plus Jake Wharton, and I have a blog at jakewharton.com. Oh, and you're speaking at DroidCon. Yes, we're here for DroidCon. So by the time this airs, hopefully the videos will be available. And we will post a link in the show notes or do a fancy annotation or card or something. So, But thanks a lot, Jake. Thanks for having me. And thanks for joining us, guys. Bye. <laughs>